hello everyone. Um, uh, welcome to this uh, new edition of the online uh, platform seminar. Uh, so today the speaker is Shijun Chen, uh, who will talk about data-driven mergers. Uh, so Shijun will have uh, 40 minutes and then there will be a discussion by uh, Greg Taylor. Um, so the seminar is recorded. Uh, at, and it will be so for an hour. After an hour, we'll uh, turn off the recording and uh, we can have a more informal discussion for those of you who don't want to, their words to be immortalized. Um, but uh, in the meantime, so during the, during the seminar, you can ask questions through the chat uh, or raise your hand. And uh, Shijun, you should try and maybe uh, uh, stop sometimes to, to, to leave the floor to, to, to take questions, but we'll have a Q&A session at the end for maybe a, a discussion. Uh, so, so please focus more on clarifying questions during the talk. Okay, I think I've spoken too much already. So Shijun, uh, if you wanna share your screen. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you everyone. So as I mentioned to Jack, I have to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to present this paper in this uh, uh, seminar. Uh, this is joint work with uh, my colleague uh, Chung Wu Chou and uh, my co-host Jia Jia Chung from Fudan University and uh, Noriaki Matsushima from Osaka University. So as you can see, this paper uh, was motivated by the data-driven mergers, uh, in particular the Google Fitbit merger case. The recent years we have seen a large amount of data-driven mergers, mainly uh, they are uh, so played or dominated by the major players like Google, Amazon, and Facebook. Just according to the recent survey, we found that among more than 300 acquisitions between uh, 2008 and 2018. And the targeted companies are particularly young and startups. Uh, one common feature is, is these business generates a large volume of consumer data. So uh, it's quite clear the primary purpose of such mergers is about consumer data. Uh, so about uh, the Google Fitbit merger, I think uh, you all know about this, but just uh, introduce a bit of uh, the background. So Google uh, offered a 2.1 billion bid for the Fitbit, uh, and this merger case is under regulatory investigation in many jurisdictions, including HOC and the European Commission. Uh, so Fitbit actually is a small player. Its market share is less than 5% uh, in 2019. So a question raised is, uh, why should we concern about uh, this uh, merger of a small firm? It seems the merger will not generate a huge impact on the market for wearables, right? Uh, also, Google said the deal was about devices, uh, so not data and that uh, they promise a Fitbit data will not be used for Google online advertisement. So, but however, the fact is Google can harvest 30 million of Fitbit users detailed health data in 24 hours, seven day, uh, by selling the wearable devices. So the main concern is uh, Google will try to monetize health data and harm consumers. So why we have this concern? So in order to interpret this, let's first uh, try to reveal Google's strategic plan or business plan behind this merger. And you will find that this merger is actually an important step of Google's ambitious plan in healthcare market. So Google started this plan actually many years ago uh, so first they started a so-called Google Health project, uh, started 10 years ago and restarted again in 2018, which aims to develop a specific search engine for medical rec records. Another project called Project Nightingale, 
It was secretly initiated in 2018, a joint project by Google Cloud and Ascension, which is the second largest uh, healthcare system in the United States. Uh, according to this joint agreement, Google uh, can access to the complete set of health records of millions of Americans. Another important project involving a company uh, which is uh, not well known called Verily. Uh, the company was founded in 2015 by Alphabet, uh, focusing on research in healthcare first. Starting from 2019, it entered into the insurance market by collaborating with John Hancock, which is a big company in the United States. And in 2020, just a month ago, it created a company called Coefficient Insurance Company with Swiss Reinsurance Group, which is one of the largest reinsurance group. Uh, as mentioned by various presidents, so we are hoping to be more personalized in the way we offer health solutions. So personalization clearly is one of the important purposes. So now when we have this big picture, it seems quite clear that uh, so Google's, uh, as a Google Fitbit merges primary purpose is for health data. So why is this case become uh, quite hot? Because uh, the problem is traditional Google, uh, sorry, merger guidelines may not be suitable for such kind of merger. Indeed, uh, so we are involved in the, uh, uh, in the uh, MSCAT brief offered to the European Commission and we have some interaction with the European Commission and they also face some kind of dilemma. So these mergers are not horizontal, not vertical, and the competition authorities may want to shoehorn these mergers into conglomerate mergers. Uh, it's this kind of merger between different uh, firms in different markets. But conglomerate mergers are mostly not harmful. Uh, in the United States, for example, no conglomerate mergers have been ever challenged since 1980. Uh, competition authorities always ask this question how yeah, without the evidence of harm. This is, this is the language from the European Commission. So I think we need a new framework and a guide, guideline for such kind of mergers. This is a, a normal or traditional type of merger. So as a first step, I think it's very really important uh, we try to develop a new theory of harm for data-driven mergers. So uh, in order to derive such kind of model, we started with market definition. Uh, of course, there are lots of rated market. So here we would like to focus on two types of markets particularly uh, relevant. First type of market we call the markets for data collection. Uh, we call it market B. Uh, they are uh, mo mostly focused on digital devices such as wearables, uh, Google Nest, or applications related to Internet of Things. Uh, one main feature is devices and apps are offered with very low prices or mainly free. Uh, the second type of the market is called market for data applications. We call it market A. Uh, these are the main market that uh, the platforms will use uh, data, big data, for personalization in their products and services. Personalization seems uh, to be the future of these markets. In particular, we are concerned about the healthcare market become a new battlefield for personalization. So questions? Okay, so, uh, so these two markets are highly correlated and the products are complementary. Uh, meanwhile, dominant uh, platform uh, may not sell the product directly into market A. What we found in the Google case is uh, they try to launch joint ventures and with the partner firms in that market, uh, like Hancock and the Swiss uh, region uh, reinsurance company. Uh, so, 
Uh, any questions on this introduction? Okay, no questions. So let's start with modeling mass storage. As you will see that actually the model is very simple. We consider two hotel lines because the two markets, each, mark, each line is for one market. So each market is served, is served by two firms uh, that we normalize the marginal cost to zero. Uh, for track, trackability uh, purpose, we assume the perfect correlation of consumer's taste. That is a consumer's taste X in market A is the same uh, of his taste in market B. Of course, this assumption is a bit extreme, uh, but we believe that uh, uh, even in the imperfect correlation case, some kind of main results could still uh, preserve. So consumer's taste X is uniformly distributed in hotel line. Uh, consider market A first. Uh, we here assume that market A has symmetric hotel competition uh, because the mainly we think uh, currently the insurance market are quite competitive. Uh, so a consumer with taste X obtains utility VA minus X from uh, insurance company A1, whereas VA minus one minus X from product A2. So A1 is located at the zero end and A2 located as end of one. Uh, without a merger, each firm offers a standard version of product. Uh, we call product A1 or A2 and the charge is hotel and uniform price. Here we use alpha uh, to denote the uniform price. They are equal to one, so very simple. Uh, now, Mark B is uh, uh, a bit different. Uh, we introduce asymmetric hoteling competition in Mark B before the merger. Why asymmetric hoteling? Because uh, Mark B uh, is a kind of wearable uh, market in which we have asymmetric players. Uh, think about the Fitbit is much smaller than Apple. Uh, so it's a bigger company. Uh, we I think Apple Watch offers a better value than Fitbit. Uh, and uh, to characterize this uh, dominance or competitive advantage, we introduce a parameter gamma. So that is a consumer with test X obtains a utility VB minus X from Fitbit, whereas a VB plus gamma minus one minus X from uh, Apple Watch, let's say. So, uh, before the merger, there's asymmetric hotel competition, and you can see the equilibrium prices. Beta one is uh, the margin of the Fitbit, and beta two is the margin of uh, Apple Watch, and the cutoff threshold is X tilde here. Okay, any questions? So uh, you may wonder why we can uh, model uh, competition in health insurance use a hoteling model. Uh, actually, we checked the literature and find the hoteling model is commonly adopted in the analysis of healthcare market. This is because health insurance or healthcare products are highly differentiated for two reasons. First, the health plans are quite complicated. It covers a broad range of different treatments and offer different co-payment rates. For instance, take, take for example, two treatments, one is knee, I have a knee problem, and, uh, and the dental treatment, I don't have a teeth problem. So suppose insurance plan A1 uh, offer 40% of cost for dental treatment and 60% of cost for the knee treatment, while A2 is in the opposite. So, you can see these two plans are differentiated. Also, second and more important, consumer health conditions vary across persons. In my case, uh, of course, I like uh, uh, the insurance plan A1 because I have knee plan, uh, a knee problem, uh, while some other people may like uh, uh, insurance uh, plan A2. So roughly, we we try to use this uh, uh, parameter X uh, and hotel competition to model uh, uh, this, uh, competition in health insurance. 
Okay. So the teacher, second remark, yes. Teacher, can I ask you a question? But that means yeah. your assumption of uh, that the costs are independent of types doesn't, uh, yeah. would be very strange with this uh, interpretation. Uh, certainly, yes, Jacques. Uh, your comment is very important. Here we assume that we lots of ingredients. So we normalize the cost and uh, also we assume that there's no uh, cream skin effect. So just in order to focus on, on the very basic condition. Yeah, uh, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, uh, it's along the same line. I had the same comment and uh, been working on health <laughs> and adverse selection is a huge issue in health. But yes. also there are a lot of regulations that uh, prevent you from uh, personalizing offers to, so, uh, so this would affect uh, the use of data in the sense that, uh, uh, which is, would be specific to health. It's not like uh, selling shoes. Huh? Yes, Bruno, your comments are very important. Actually, uh, we were a bit worried about this, but uh, after we we found some very interesting uh, evidence, uh, uh, we are a bit confident about personalization in healthcare. So look at this. So. Uh, McKenzie actually estimated as the uh, annual value of applying big data is $100 billion. And uh, uh, actually, according to what we found that uh, starting from years ago, uh, several insurance companies begin using personalization. So one important uh, health uh, care plan is actually initiated by Ernst & Young called a pay as you live product. So basically uh, insurance company offer you, you know, uh, a wearable devices tracking uh, your health information. If you agree on this, you will receive some kind of discount. And uh, uh, on top of that, you will also receive a different kind of accommodations. Uh, in, in United States, there are several companies doing such kind of practice. In, in European, Union, at least 50% of firms expect their willingness to do or they are doing experimental uh, uh, or experimenting of such kind of personalization. Yeah. Thank you very much for your comments. Any other questions? Okay. So, so these are the two separate markets. Now, uh, one important feature is we want to uh, model the merger. Uh, what's the impact on merger? What's the main feature of the merger? Uh, so the most important uh, feature of the merger is this merger will hinge two separate markets together. The way of such kind of linking is uh, Google can incorporate uh, wearable devices into its ecosystem and uh, package it with other Google products. So in order to capture such kind of benefit, uh, we assume that combining health data with non-health data allows Google to deliver extra value, Omega, within one, let's say it's for assumption, for consumers. That is consumer, when they use the personalized uh, health care products, uh, combining with other Google's product uh, will generate uh, a so-called consumption signature. Here, consumption signature omega measures pharmacy's competitive advantage. Uh, so in presentation here, for simplicity, we assume uh, phi A equal to one and C equal to zero. Sorry, I, I skipped one slide. Uh, well, modeling personalization. Uh, now, suppose firm B1 is acquired by uh, Google, who is partnering with uh, A1, an insurance company. So Google can consolidate consumer data and improve its capacity uh, in personalization. Uh, here we introduce some kind of efficiency uh, gain for personalization. We assume that the cost of personalization in variable market is, is very high because of these hardware. So instead, Google can use consumer data for personalization in market A, as mentioned, this is health insurance market, and deliver a personalized version of, of health insurance. For instance, when 
uh, Google knows exactly my health conditions and uh, they know uh, I have a knee problem and they can, uh, or the insurance company, the partner insurance company can offer me a personalized insurance plan. Let's say, hi, Zijun, we are going to cover 100% of your knee treatment. Uh, are you happy with that? Of course, I'm happy with that. But uh, then the problem is they can raise the price. So we here assume that personalize a product deliver uh, and improve the matching value. So instead of having VA minus X here, uh, after I receive this personalized product, my matching value improved by phi a x, so become v a minus one minus phi a x. Here phi a uh, measures uh, platform or Google's capacity of data analytics. Uh, that is personalization can reduce welfare loss due to mismatching by this amount phi a x. Of course, there's cost of offering personalized product. Uh, so in the presentation here, we will assume phi a equal to one and c equal to zero for simplicity. Uh, okay, so this uh, is uh, the uh, modern methodology for personalization. Now, timing of the game, because there are two markets, so we would like to uh, introduce a kind of a bit dynamic feature of the market. So we assume in period one, firms set prices in market B, that is uh, the market for wearables. And then consumers buy either B1 or B2. And then in period two, firms set prices in market A and consumers buy A1 and A2. Uh, we also assume that consumers are not forward looking, uh, they are myopic, and uh, we solve for the equilibrium using backward induction. Okay. So let's consider the sub again in period two. Uh, suppose. Uh, uh, sorry, Jijun, uh, Jacques yes. speaking. Uh, can you go yeah. back to the previous slide? Yes. Uh, I, I'm somewhat worried about your uh, thing that consumers are not forward looking because it means that uh, yeah. a consumer would not uh, realize that if he uh, uh, buys uh, Fitbit is going to get better insurance from uh, Google. That's basically what you are assuming that the consumers are unaware of the benefits of matching, and that's clearly going to buy. I mean, it seems to me that I'm not sure it's clear, but it would seem to me that this is going to bias the the analysis against the merger. Okay, Jacques, thank you very much. Uh... Yes, this is just, a, I think, for simplicity of analysis, we definitely should consider extension to relax this, uh, this assumption. Yeah, I, I doubt uh, the result will change a bit. Okay, can thank I, you very much, Jackson. Yes. Can I follow up on this? Uh, yeah. So it, maybe one way of capturing this uh, non, you know, more, less forward-looking forward consumers could be saying that I wanted to ask a question about the data externalities. So because okay. here you only allow the firm to personalize using the data of the consumer from one market and the personalized product on the other market. Yeah. How could we interpret your model if you want to capture also this, uh, you know, Google knowing something about some group of consumers and correlating this information with what yeah. it knows on other consumers and basically doing personalization also on those others uh, who did not buy from Google in oh, the first part okay. market. So yeah. could that be a way of capturing this in a reduced form approach? Maybe then that might be a way of capturing this also not forward looking aspect, which could be generated due to, I mean, it, these are not the same things, mm. but just the, in terms of the reduced form, how much it would play a role in the, in the model. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, so we did not consider this inter-consumer uh, inter externalities, but that's really important. Yes, we should consider this in some extension. Yeah, thank you, Audrey. Any other questions? Okay, uh, so uh, now let, let's uh, solve the subgame in 
in period two first. Uh, that's a very simple game. Suppose uh, consumers has already, have already made a decision and the firm C's market share is given by X star. So this is determined by beta one, beta two. So then, uh, because now uh, firm C has consumer data from zero to X star, uh, these consumers have purchased uh, the Fitbit wearables. And then Google can deliver personalized products to these consumers with improved value, PA. Uh, so one important feature of personalized product we would like to capture is personalized product is offered privately to a particular consumer. That gives the firm some kind of flexibility. Naturally, a personalized product comes along with personalized price because it's offered in personalized way. So uh, we also assume that the firm C can prevent uh, target consumers from access its standard product. That, that is, Google can block your search to the standard product and offer you the personalized product only. Uh, so uh, we, in this case, we assume that firms set uniform prices first because they can be observed and then firm C offers personalized prices. Okay, so, sorry. Competition, uh, first uh, let's think about the competition between personalized price and the uniform price. When firm A2 set a uniform price alpha two, uh, uh, firm C can best respond to this price. Uh, so a targeted consumers now has two options. Uh, he will receive personalized offer. Meanwhile, he can uh, compare the offer from, uh, from A2 standard products. So using uh, consuming the personalized product gives uh, extra value, as we mentioned that now the matching value is VA, not VA minus X, and the extra value uh, consumption signature omega. So a consumer is willing to pick this only if VA plus omega minus PAX, here PAX is the personalized price, is greater than the outside option from uh, firm A2. So uh, we assume that firm A2 is willing to accept uh, this uh, uh, offer as long as uh, indifferent. So this gives PAX equal to omega plus X plus this one. So here, Clearly, omega plus x is the extra benefit from personalization and from the merger. But look at this formula. It's very clear that Google can capture all these benefits from consumers. That is, if the target consumer uh, accepts the offer from personalized products, he is left the same surplus from outside option. As if consuming the product A2. And uh, efficiency gain, actually, omega plus X from personalization are all extracted by Google through personalized pricing. So this generates a very strong effect of exploitation, we call the exploitation effect. Actually, you can imagine that targeted consumers can be worse off because before the merger, uh, the symmetric hoteling competition, only the marginal consumer located at uh, X equal to one half will be indifferent between A1 and A2. All consumers on the left-hand side of one half are better off because they prefer A1. Now, all consumers, all targeted consumers receive the same surplus as if they are forced to, or uh, they have to buy A2. In this sense, all the consumer circle, surplus exceeding the outside options are extracted uh, through personalization. Okay, the second effect we call the profit squeeze effect of personalization. Uh, this uh, terminology is not uh, perfect. That is, personalization actually makes firms very aggressive in com the price competition and uh, could uh, squeeze uh, the rival's profit. 
uh, because of personalized offers, pharmacy is ready to offer each targeted customer its lowest price, PAX equal to zero, without reducing the price to others. For instance, I'm going to make an offer to Bruno, and suppose he uh, Alex is competing with me, I can offer Bruno, if he's a marginal consumer, price equal to zero without affecting my offers to other consumers. But Alex cannot do this because Alex has to offer uniform price to all consumers. So this gives uh, uh, firm C uh, some kind of flexibility and makes uh, this uh, firm very aggressive. On top of that, that is, uh, firm C can secure consumers from zero to X star. On top of that, it can also compete for the other consumers from X star to one. On these consumers, firm C does not have data. It has to offer uniform price, but this uniform price can be lower. So what you can find actually is the pricing equilibrium in this uh, uh, game is, Firm C can offer personalized price PAX to consumers located from zero to X star. On top of that, uh, it can offer uniform price alpha one, which is lower than alpha two from to consumers between X star and X hat. And then firm two's market share actually is squeezed from one half to this part. As a result, we can see actually uh, uh, from two support can be reduced dramatically. So these are the, uh, the equivalent price in the sub game given X star. Okay. So now uh, let's go back to stage one or period one. Uh, we can solve for the equivalent price in market B. Here we assume that omega is sufficiently large. So we can write down uh, from C's total profit because its profit from market A is very clear uh, from zero to X star, it will charge a personalized price PAX and then uniform price to serve these consumers. On top of that, uh, it can make a profit in market B by charging the margin beta one, so serve X star. So after reorganize, we can find this formula. And from B2, the profit is very simple. It's beta two times one minus X star. So solving this whole 10 type of competition actually is quite easy. And we can find the equilibrium prices that are related to uh, gamma and omega. So beta one star equal to this. Uh, clearly you can see that uh, beta one star is uh, uh, from C's equilibrium margin uh, in the wearable market. Uh, assuming omega greater than gamma greater than one, immediately you can see that beta one star is below zero. That is, uh, uh, you, we can, we call this equilibrium, this equilibrium with accommodation because from A to B to still uh, exist, uh, still uh, survive, survive in the market. And this figure gives you clear connection of the hinge between two markets. So beta one is below cost, beta two of course above cost, and X star is the market share for firm C in both markets. Well, in market A, you can see the, the pricing is given like this way. So solving for this simple game, we find uh, several important effects. First, we find a cross subsidization between markets. Uh, that is uh, firms, C will price its wearable product below cost. Uh, this uh, below cost pricing is driven by two forces. First, uh, see the incentives of exploitation because here, when Omega increases its profit uh, from market A, it's increasing with X star, it has extra incentives to expand its market share. Uh, Second, it's also driven by the rival's competitive advantage, gamma, because when the gamma is higher, it imposes a barrier for firm C to expand. It has to reduce. Uh, meanwhile, we find the two types of externalities across markets. The first externality is a negative externality from market A to B. That is, 
consumption signature imposes next externality on the price in mark B, you can see that uh, both beta 1, beta 2 decreases with omega. Uh, so interestingly, uh, there's a positive externality from mark B to mark A imposed by Apple's competitive advantage, say gamma. You can find that actually the uniform prices in mark A increases with gamma. So that is because uh, from B2, that's the Apple, actually brings countervailing power, which can restrict firm C's expansion in market B. And this, of course, benefit from A2. So one in interesting finding is a dominant player in market B, such as Apple, could protect a small player in market A. So while this is one type of equilibrium, when this equilibrium arises when omega is reasonably uh, uh, big, not very, not sufficiently large, when Google's efficiency gain or consumption signature is sufficiently large, you can imagine that uh, Google has incentives to monopolize both both market because the benefit from expansion of the exploitation is huge. So Google can set a predator pricing and uh, which can actually exclude uh, the competitors in both markets. So monopolization can arise. Of course, one uh, important policy recommendation is competition authority should ban predator pricing. Uh, so questions? Shijun, uh, you have five minutes left. Okay, so quite good. Now I finished the model. Let's now go to this uh, policy implications. First, uh, we would like to sum up uh, the, what we find a theory of harm from this merger. We find that Google can leverage its dominance into wearable markets and hurt small competitors. Uh, Google can sell Fitbit Watch below cost uh, or enter agreement with other insurers. It can recoup this loss while other small firms cannot, and Google will monetize health data and harm consumers. Uh, consolidating health data yes. with Sorry, health Jijun. data can make an enormous profit. Yes. Jijun, I have a question. Uh, your second point here, I didn't see the small competitors in your model. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> here, uh, yes, we, we uh, in particular, in Mark B, we, we do not incorporate this. Yeah. So that's not the conclusion of your model. That's your opinion, but that's not really the conclusion of the model. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So what's the policy implications we, we would like to offer is, uh, because the assessment of this merger is really complicated. Of course, blocks the merger will preserve the current playing field uh, uh, for and the benefit uh, competitors, and they also can protect consumers. But uh, there's a short run uh, welfare loss for consumers because of this conception synergy. And Google is good at uh, offering a personalized product, which can further uh, benefit consumers. Uh, OK. so. Uh, if we do not consider blocking, uh, the blocking the merger, so some kind of remedies may be important. Uh, but uh, once again, designing a suitable package of remedies becomes very difficult. Here we just we would like to try to offer some kind of workable remedies. First, we find that uh, restriction on bill cost pricing could be helpful because it can prevent Google from excluding uh, the rival in both markets. Uh, but in the short run, this will raise a price, may harm consumers, but could benefit them in the long run. Second, uh, prohibition of tie and bundling and other exclusionary strategies can uh, benefit uh, competitors. Third, uh, uh, we consider requirement of data sharing that is, if competition authority can uh, require Google to share the insurance, the health data with other competitors. There's, of, of course, pros and cons of sharing. The side effect, Google will have less incentive to collect the health data. 
and there are also the data privacy concern issues. Okay, so finally, I would like to uh, uh, just have a best brief discussion of related literature. So this paper benefits a lot uh, from two very important reports uh, on digital market, uh, KMAX uh, uh, with others and Scott Morton's. Also, we would like to say this paper is highly complementary to Alex and Greg's paper. Well, maybe they would disagree. <laughs> and also with uh, Matthew Mota and Martin Pies. Uh, they use reducer form where, where uh, we try to provide a micro foundation for such a merger. Uh, and uh, this paper also builds on a large literature of personalized, uh, personalized pricing and personalization. Uh, okay. Conclusions. So this, this paper is um, motivated by the Google Fit merger. We develop a very simple model to examine the impact of such merger. The model captures two main features of such mergers. First, a merger firm, merger firm can use in consumer data for personalization. Second, the merger hinges market together and can create a cross market effects. So we found that uh, personalization leads to exploitation, which can harm consumers and uh, hurts competitors. Uh, in particular, when concept signature is sufficiently high, the merger can result in monopolization. This is a risk. Uh, we also discussed the policy implications consider various merger remedies. Okay, uh, that's uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, I should stop sharing. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks um, for the opportunity to discuss this interesting paper. Um, I think everyone on the call knows that this is really an important topic, especially at the moment. Um, and I think this is an area where we need to get a better handle on how to do policy. So I was particularly glad to see in the latest version of the paper, um, what I think are some rel uh, relevant policy issues really addressed head on. Um, one of the things that I thought was quite neat in this paper that I haven't seen in a lot of others is that it has this conceptual dichotomy between, um, on the one hand, using data um, for analytics, so how good is my analysis technology, and on the other, the idea of the scale of my data set. And this is something that I've seen a lot in the debate. Is this about the amount of data I have or is it about the quality of my algorithm or both? Um, and so I wondered if there are ways to push that idea a bit further in the model. Um, one thing I noticed, for example, is that um, in the model, analytics plays an important role in determining how well I can personalize my product for consumers, but it doesn't really affect how good I am at personalizing my price for those consumers. I can always do that perfectly accurately. And so I was curious if there's a meaningful way to get at the idea that um, a better algorithm might also help me to personalize and my price as well as the product. Um, I guess, uh, Zhijun, that you won't be too surprised to hear that one of the things that was most interesting to me was the idea about the spillovers between the two markets, given that that's something that we've been working on as well. Um, and particularly, I like the result you have about the countervailing power that a big firm in market B can exert. Um, I guess the results you have on those spillovers, they're sort of colored in a way by the assumption um, that the locations of the consumer in the two markets is personally, is perfectly correlated. Um, and you say you do that for tractability, so perhaps um, it's not possible to relax that assumption, but it also seemed to me um, that there could be interesting questions to ask if you were able to relax that. Um, for example, it seems very natural to me that if um, Google were to uh, acquire Fitbit um, and Fitbit's mode of operation stops being about competing in the wearables market and it becomes much more about gathering data to use in some other market, um, then Google might want to reposition future versions of Fitbit's product to help okay. better serve that objective by changing the types of consumer it attracts. And so it seems like there's a lot of interesting questions there that you might be able to get at. Um, I think the Fitbit example is obviously nice because insurance is a market where personalized pricing and also product personalization are obviously important. 
Um, I shared a little bit, I think, um, the reaction of Jacques and Bruno in that it's very hard for me to think about that market and not worry about issues like adverse selection. Um, so in the paper, you talk about this idea of a risk group. Um, but if I understood correctly, you really would need that whatever data is being gathered is somehow orthogonal um, to the risks implied with a consumer. And it was really hard for me to understand how it can be that I can get more data about um, my customers and not cause bigger adverse selection problems from my rival. And more to the point, not make my rival want to redesign its base insurance um, package as a, a, in response to that. Um, and so I think when motivating the example, it's important to bear in mind um, that this is a model where you have products that are sort of immutably differentiated and the data is about, is this consumer a better fit for me or my rival? Um, and be very clear about how you tie um, that to the example that you use. Um, a couple of quick points to finish up um, that I guess are sort of not just specific to this paper, but more comments on how economists are tackling these issues in general. Um, one is that, um, you know, we know in this TSA Viva style model um, that we get the effect of intensified competition when firms know more about their consumer consumers. Um, I think that's a little bit special to the TSA Viva framework. And so it's important to bear in mind um, you know, that those two things go hand in hand um, when thinking about this context that we might apply the model to. And the other is that, um, you know, some of the other examples besides the Google Fitbit merger um, are cases where prices don't seem to be very important. You know, if I think about Facebook, WhatsApp, for example. Um, and so then it seems to be more about product personalization than pricing personalization in a way. And I guess as economists, something we know how to do really well is model price discrimination. So there's always a tendency to want to do that. Um, it's not always clear to me that that's the first order issue. And so I wondered in particular in your model, whether you can say anything about the case um, with product um, personalization, but not price personalization and whether that um, could also yield something of interest. Um, so I guess that's all I have to say for now. Um, and I will hand back to Alex. Thanks, Greg. Um, so let, let, let me start by a, a question and actually which is related to a, a point that uh, Greg made. Um, so you make the assumption that, uh, that you have perfect correlation between the, the type on market A and on market B. Uh, but then, uh, so, so first I think that there's a bit of a, Maybe there's a bit of a problem in terms of interpretation, because if you interpret the position on market A as being, say, the relative state of your knee versus your teeth, uh, then uh, it seems hard to me uh, to imagine that this would be correlated with your preference between Apple Watch and uh, Fitbit, right? So I think yeah. first, that's the first issue that I have. And so in a sense, I would, uh, I would like to... Uh, I would be curious to see what happens if you don't make this assumption. And then I think it's not so innocuous. Um, it seems important to me because it seems like, uh, so, so the firm is going to learn uh, the willingness to pay of consumers that are in the turf, in its turf on market A only. Yes. Whereas if you had, and so it can extract all the value from those guys and those guys are not going to be poached by the, by the rival. Whereas if you have a, a a different story in which uh, what you learn, um, in which you, you may uh, you may learn something about a consumer who might be may, maybe is going to buy a Fitbit, uh, but he would be very close to eight. Uh, so sorry, I'm getting confused with the A and the B. So he's going to buy Fitbit, but he would be very close to A2. Uh, and so in that case, the fact that you have information would allow you to offer him a, a very low price. Uh, and this could uh, really intensify competition. So in the end, I mean, you went a bit quickly, so I wasn't completely sure what happens on the overall on consumer surplus on market A, I was a bit lost there, uh, but it seems to me that this assumption of perfect correlation sort of uh, uh, makes it harder for you to get pro-competitive effects. Yeah. Um, 
And uh, now, uh, if someone has any question, feel free to, to ask. Uh, I have a question or comment that uh, I, I'm a bit puzzled by the story about the merger. If I'm, I mean, there is a market for data. So why do you need to buy a company to get the data? And uh, how the model would work if you have a market where a firm B is just selling data to the firm on market A? And uh, let's say, uh, I guess that if firm B has full bargaining power, uh, the model will give the same outcome or something. Uh, so it may depend on the balance of bargaining power, some old up problem, something. But I, I don't see the story that distinguish for the moment uh, merger and, uh, uh, and sale of data. So. Uh, OK, Sh can I answer this question? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, but you know, your yeah, questions are very important. So, so here, uh, so the main difference is, uh, well, if you buy data, you will not uh, affect competition in market B. But if you acquire this company in market B, you will have incentives to collect more data. In order to collect more data, you will be aggressive to expand in your consumer base. So I, I guess this uh, is, is the main difference. Yeah, but the firm in market B knows that he can sell the data, so they will compete to buy the data, to acquire okay. data, to be able to sell. So there okay. would be also an effect that is similar through the, the market. Mm, yes, uh, that's a really good question. Uh, yeah, yeah, in principle, I guess there will be the similar effect. Yeah, but... Uh, uh, also here with uh, uh, another fact that we, we modeled is combining this data will have a uh, consumption synergy, but according to your idea, <laughs> that, that, that could be the similar. Um, okay, and thank if, you very much. If I, may, if I may add something, uh, yeah. I, when I read, yeah. I think it was a report from the um, Australian Competition Authority uh, yeah, regarding this precise merger. They, I, I think what they found uh, was that uh, Fitbit was about to enter the market for data anyway. So they, they were going to start, or they are going, irrespective of the merger, they will, gonna, they, they will start licensing data to other players. Maybe they uh, will stop. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, after it's acquired, maybe start doing. So, so which report you found? I so think the ACCC had a report. A uh, inquiry, data inquiry. It's in June 2000. Uh, I think it was specific to, uh, I will send you the link. If you remember. Okay, okay. Uh, Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Can I add something on that? Because uh, yes. this is where Google gets into the picture. Uh, if you're going to sell data on a competitive market, yes. Clear. But if the firm on A, let's say, is Google is a very powerful company who is able to yes. exert market power, yeah. Then the one will, I mean, the market for data will not give the full value to the market to the seller on market. Oh. Oh, yes. Uh, so if you use a Nash bargaining solution, they may be kind of hold up problem in the back okay. that would justify the merger. Okay, yes, thank you very much. Yeah, oh, in this case, Google can fully acquire the benefits of data because it becomes like a mono monopoly for these consumer data. Otherwise, if Fitbit can sell data, it cannot commit only sell to uh, Google or maybe this other opportunity, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Other questions? Uh, uh, a, are there any, sorry. Yeah, I, really I have a question, yeah. question or okay. comment. So I was wondering okay. what the role of Apple is in your model, like fitting it to the actual Google Fitbit merger, because Apple obviously not only a large player in the wearables market, the dominant play on the wearables market, but it's also very active in the med tech market. And they also have tie ups with insurance companies, yeah. uh, developing apps and using data. So actually, if you, if you model that aspect as well, it's really sort of competition, becomes competition between two yes. C type firms. Uh, 
Thank you very much. So here we model Apple as a countervailing power in market B2. As you mentioned, actually Apple is preparing uh, to enter insurance market. Uh, so maybe we would expect a sector merger if this merger is approved. Maybe Apple is going to uh, acquire some insurance company, <laughs> not, not to the wearable uh, devices. Yeah, I understand they actually in 2019, they already partnered with Aetna, which is, I think, one of the big insurance players. Which company? Aetna, A-E-T-N-A. A-E-T-N-A, -E -E oh, okay. can you find on this side? Uh, maybe I Yeah, you just search okay. Apple Aetna partnership. Oh, this, yeah, okay. So, yeah, specifically that, for this, important. Mm. the same kind of idea. Okay, yeah, so, so that, that would be very interesting, yeah. And I think the other thing that's missing in terms of, you know, the what's actually going on in the merger is the operating yeah. system, um, which I think may okay. be a, an yeah. important motivation for the merger, which is Google is, uh, has its wearable operating system. Android. Which, oh, yeah. which, well, it's not Android, it's a specific to wearables. And it's trying to get more and more uh, wearable manufacturers to adopt their operating system, but Fitbit was not adopting it. So by acquiring Fitbit, it gets a, a major right. player onto that operating system through the network effects, could then get other manufacturers on there and dominate the operating system in competition with Apple's own operating system for wearables. And that might be a, another motivation for the merger, which potentially could oh. be more important. Oh, that's important because I did not see any kind of discussion on this. Oh, I, I was thinking they all use the Android system. Oh, so Google has to wrap it. Oh system for. So we know that Google actually uh, developed this uh, wearables but was not successful. Yeah. Hasn't been, okay. It hasn't been uh, so successful, but I think there, yeah. there are a few wearable manufacturers adopting it, um, the operating system, quite a few. Um, but okay. obviously if it gets Fitbit on there um, with so many users, then it'll get more developers developing yeah. their operating system and you know the network effects could uh, you know, lead to more and more manufacturers adopting it. Oh, sure, yes, of course. It's called Wear OS. Wear OS, okay. Yeah. OS, okay. Awesome. Good, thank you very much. Jim. Are there any other questions, comments? I have a question, but for yes. uh, after we've stopped uh, recording, because it's a general <laughs> dangerous uh, one. Stupid question. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so in that case, maybe now is a good time to uh, thank Shijun. So I will stop the recording now. And. Um, and so uh, thank you very much. Uh